Benjamin Zander has conducted the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra for 20 years. He is also artistic director of the music program at Walnut Hill, a high school for the performing arts in Boston. As a writer, he co-authored The Art of Possibility, Transforming Professional and Personal Life. He talked to head teachers at a conference organized by the National College of School Leadership. I'm a teacher like you. I teach at the conservatory in Boston. I have a class on Friday afternoon. People come from all over the world and they're excited to be there and they're eager to learn, you know. But what's really going on, they're saying, am I better than her? Am I better than him? I know I'm better than her. I don't think I'll ever be as good as him. I hope I can be as good as her. They're constantly comparing and they're measuring. And when they can't come out to play, let's say the violin, it looks as though there's one person playing the violin, right? There are two people. There's a person who's playing the violin, and then there's another person standing behind the person who's playing the violin, whispering in his ear, you haven't practiced enough. <laughs> do you know how many people play this piece better than you do? That difficult passage, you missed it the last time. It's coming right up. You're gonna miss it again. That's the voice in the head. And if anybody's saying, what does he mean, a voice in the head? What's he talking about, a voice in the head? That's the voice I mean. <laughs> Took a moment for you to hear it, right? <laughs> but that voice keeps talking and talking and talking, and it never stops. You know, sometimes it talks so loudly that it drowns out the music. So my job is to get hold of that voice. And this is how it works. I do it each year. I come into my class at the beginning of the year, and there are about 40 students in my class, and I say, after a little bit of housekeeping, I say, your grade for the year is an A. You're an A, that's your grade. And there's one condition. The condition is that they have to write me a letter in the first two weeks of the class, of the year. The letter must be dated the following May, when the class ends. So the, letter, the date at the top is May 2000 of the next year. And then the letter must begin with these words, Dear Mr. Zander, I got my A because... Then they have to write a letter describing who they will have become by the following May to justify this extraordinary grade. And I tell them to fall passionately in love with the person they're describing in the letter. And they do. They write about who they would be, who they could be, who they see themselves as. Only that damn voice would stop telling them they can't do it. When I come into class, the person I teach is the person that they have described in their letter. You see, I only take A students. Now, there are a few people looking very concerned and saying, how does he do that? Well, the answer is very simple. You can give an A to anybody. You can give an A to a, a waitress in a restaurant, to a taxi driver. You can give an A to the other drivers when you're driving in traffic. You can give an A to your mother-in-law. You can give an A to your boss. You can give an A to anybody. What happens when you give an A is that the relationship is transformed. This is hard for teachers. I know this is very, very hard. I addressed a group of teachers earlier this year uh, and one of them came up to me afterwards and said, I like this giving an A, it's sweet, he said. <laughs> uh, but he said, but it doesn't make, you don't know the students, you, you don't know them, you don't know their work. So I imagine as the year progresses and you find out that some of them are quite mediocre, I imagine you modify the grade, right? I said, no, and then I tell them about this young girl I met. She's about 15. I said, what's your name? She said, Joy. <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon. She said, Joy. Now, should her parents modify her name? <laughs> no, because we don't give children a name as an expectation to live up to. We give children a name as a possibility to live into. The person who understood this perfectly was Michelangelo, and I'm sure you've heard this beautiful thing, but it bears repeating. Somebody asked Michelangelo about sculpting, and he said, oh, sculpting is easy, because you have a piece of marble. Inside the piece of marble is a beautiful statue. All you need is a hammer and a chisel just to get rid of all the stone that's in the way. And then I... That's actually a theory of education. It's, of course, not the one we use. The one we use, we're up here, the students are down here, and they try to get up and they do their homework and they work hard and they study and, they, and they, they work as hard as they can and this is as far as they get. This is the gap between their achievement and our standards. And of course they're very manipulative because they know what we want to hear so they can get up a little higher. Michelangelo's model is totally different. It's eye to eye. We each have a hammer and a chisel and we're working to get rid of all that stone that's in the way of that beautiful statue. It's a totally different world. 
And it came home to me very powerfully one day. I was, this was the first year I'd ever done this with the A, and I was really excited about it. And I came into class, and I said to the, all the class were there, and I said, what does it feel like to get an A in the first class of the year? I mean, you haven't done anything, you get an A. What does that feel like? To my amazement, one of the Asian students put up his hand like that. <laughs> Forgive me for my attempt at his accent. He said, uh, in Taiwan, he said, I was number 68 out of 70 students. I come to boss, Mr. Zander says, I'm an A. It's very confusing, he said. I am number 68 out of 70. Mr. Zander says, I'm an A, but I am number 68. I walk three weeks, very confused. Then one day I discover much happier A than number 68. I decide I'm an A. <laughs> <laughs> I call that cosmic laughter. That's not head teacher's laughter, that's cosmic laughter. Because what you're laughing at is the realization, of course, that the A is invented, the 68 is invented. We might as well invent something that lights up our life and the life of the people around us. I don't know if you know this, but in, about in America, in our music schools, we have about half our students from Asia, from China and Japan and Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and all these places. And they play fantastically well. They're great. They win the competitions, but they don't speak up in class. And I found out why. I actually asked them. I said, what is this about? And they explained to me. They said, Mr. Zander, you have to understand, in Asia, it's very important to be right. The teacher is always right. And the students try to be right. And as one of these young ladies said, the best way to be right is not to say anything. Then you won't be wrong. <laughs> now, I believe the exact opposite, which is you cannot learn anything unless you make a mistake. So I tell my students, when you make a mistake, celebrate. And the way to celebrate is like this. How fascinating. It's actually quite difficult. Try it out on the golf course next time you're out. <laughs> you know why it's difficult is because when we make a mistake, we tend to pull down. The body pulls down. Notice the next time you make a mistake, the body pulls down. Now, instead, when it pulls down, you go, how fascinating. It's like this. It's difficult to do, you know. We had a conference of leaders of the music world, you know, uh, heads of orchestras and schools and opera houses and so on. And we had a three-day conference. And there was a lot of what I call downward spiral speaking. I don't know what the head teacher's downward spirals are, but I'll tell you some of the musical downward spirals. The little old ladies who like classical music, they're all dying, so there's not going to be an audience. <laughs> the children don't learn instruments anymore. All they do is watch MTV, so they're not going to grow up liking classical music. Okay? And the National Endowment of the Arts is not, a, is not supporting and the foundations aren't supporting the arts the way they used to, so we're going to run out of funds. By the end of the second day, people were walking around the corridor in the hotel like this. <gasps> <coughs> because, you know, everywhere there's downward spirals. You can't get around. I was looking at the Times this morning, and I thought of bringing it in and showing you how many columns in the Times are downward spirals. It's amazing. Every column is a downward spiral. Of course, the stock market, that's a downward spiral. Downward spiral. Also, upward spiral. Upward spiral and downward spiral are actually the same thing. Because wherever you have a winner and a loser, you automatically have a downward spiral. So, of course, sports is full of downward spiral, but it doesn't matter in sports because we all go out for a beer afterwards. <laughs> but our educational system is based on a downward spiral because there's nowhere to go from an A but down. So we shouldn't be surprised if our kids look anxious. Sometimes it seems as though there's nothing but downward spiral, which of course isn't true, which is why I asked for another flip chart. Now over here, we have possibility, the world of possibility, the realm of possibility, and this is where the vision is. And vision is very important. Vision is really important. Because you know, people get confused about vision. They say, oh, so our vision is to be number one. We have no, that's a goal. Vision, to be a vision, has to be for everybody. Everybody. At this conference, somebody stood up in front of the whole group and said, 3% of the population likes classical music. If we could move it to 4%, our problem would be over. I say everybody loves classical music, they just haven't found out about it yet. <laughs> How would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you thought 3% of the population likes classical music? If only we could. How would you talk? How would you walk? How would you be if you thought everybody loves classical music? They just haven't found out about it. These two worlds are totally different worlds. I had an amazing discovery. This is a really big deal for me. I was 45, I'd been conducting for over 20 years, and suddenly one day I had this kind of road to Damascus event. Eureka! I realized the conductor of an orchestra doesn't make a sound. <laughs> My picture appears on the front of the CD. <laughs> But the conductor doesn't make a sound. He depends for his power on his ability to make other people powerful. And when, I, when that happened, it changed everything. People in my orchestra said, 
what happened to you, Ben? What happened? That was what happened. I realized my job was to awaken possibility in other people. Because I wanted to know whether I was doing that. And you know how you find out? You look at their eyes. If their eyes are shining, you know you're doing it. You could light up a village with this guy's eyes. <laughs> if the eyes are shining, you know you're doing it. If the eyes are not shining, you get to ask a question. Who am I being that my player's eyes are not shining? We can do that with our children too. Who am I being that my children's eyes are not shining? Now over here, we have goals. Have you noticed how goals tend to be rather grim? We have a goal. It's a rather grim pursuit. We have to make the goal. Now over here, you can have a goal as part of the vision, by all means. You have a goal, and if you make the goal, great. And if you don't, how fascinating. Because <laughs> you know, we all know. We all know why we have goals. Why do we have goals? To make our eyes shine, that's all. That's the reason we have a goal. So if the goal posts are too close together, you can't score. If they're too far apart, it's too easy. So if it's not working, the eyes aren't shining, move the goal post. You know, that's the thing. <laughs> now, over here, over here you have the words, you should, you ought, you need, and you must. Try those out on your children and see if their eyes shine. <laughs> over here we have things like, how about, what if, what are we looking for? What's next? Over here, you see, it's totally different language. Totally different. Now, over here, you have blame and fault and threat. And over here, requests and apologies. Totally different. This is where we put people down and also put people up. Over here, everybody gets an A. It's a totally different world. Now, the leader, the new leader, is the one who, first of all, can distinguish the downward spiral and then has the power to take people from there over here to radiating possibility, and anybody can do it. Anybody, an eight-year-old child can do it. Anybody can do it. There's a key. There's a key to the kingdom of possibility. I'm going to give you the key to the kingdom of possibility right now. Okay, so this is the story. It always comes in a story. Okay, the story is this. Two prime ministers were sitting in a room, and they had a conversation about affairs of state, you know, the way prime ministers do. And um, suddenly the door bursts open, and a man comes in in a state of apoplectic upset. He's just like this and it's making so much noise and racket and carries on because they stop their conversation. And the resident prime minister says, Peter, please remember rule number six. Immediately, Peter's restored to complete calm. He bows, he apologizes, and he walks out of the room. They go back to their conversation. 20 minutes later, the door bursts open again. A woman comes in. She's hysterical and her hair is flying and she's mascara is running. Everything is a mess. And shouting again and again, the prime minister says, Maria, Please remember rule number six. <gasps> Immediately she bows, she apologizes, she walks out of the room. And then 20 minutes later, it happens for the third time. The third time, the visiting prime minister says, my dear colleague, he says, this is astonishing. He said, I don't believe it. Three people have come into this room out of control. And you just say rule number six. Would you be willing to share what this rule number six is? He said, oh, it's rule number six. Very simple. Don't take yourself so goddamn seriously. He says, oh, that's a wonderful rule. What may I ask of the other rules? There aren't any. <laughs> Cosmic laughter. Pretty tentative, I must say. <laughs> now, it comes down to three things. Three things. One, it's all invented. You've got to get that. It's all invented. Two, standing in possibility. And three, rule number six. <laughs> that's it. Simple. 